I'm a family medicine physician in Dallas, Texas, and I work in the outpatient setting, which means I see patients outside of the hospital. And I wanted to share just some of my impression of what's going on in the Dallas-Fort Worth area with regard to COVID-19 right now. And today is Friday, March 27th. So a few days ago, I started to get the sense that what I saw happening in Italy and in Spain, and it was beginning to happen in New York City, I started to see the early signs of that happening here in Dallas. And it just so happens, I just happen to be someone, because I'm a physician and I do telemedicine right now, that I was able to, I was able to um, recognize signs of this, of this happening, maybe before the average person could. So I saw more and more of my telemedicine visits that are done uh, with people all across the state of Texas, including Dallas. I saw more and more people with signs of COVID, very consistent signs of COVID. I also was receiving a lot of uh, information just because I'm a physician and I read physician type things uh, from doctors in New York and, and, and translations of what's happening in Italy. And I was seeing it all come together. And what, it, what it occurred to me is that we're at the moment, we're probably about 10 to 14 days before what is now playing out right now in New York City, what played out in Italy probably a week or two ago, which is essentially this huge upswell of very sick people with COVID-19, many old, but not all old, many middle-aged people, that so much, so much sickness that even the best hospitals, best trained staff and physicians are not able to keep up with it. And a lot of people dying. So I felt like it was a chance for me, it was really important to me to share with, with my friends this is the moment to pay attention, even though, and I get it, even though it doesn't seem that scary, and even though it seems like everything's fine and it's spring and the weather's beautiful, it's critically important right now to stay in your home and not go out, not go out and interact with your friends, not go out and interact with your family, not go to the grocery store or Home Depot like I did last week, which wasn't smart. Because at this moment, there's so much COVID, much more than the tests will indicate because we're not really testing that many people in Dallas right now. There's so much COVID that when you go out, there's a pretty decent chance that you're gonna have an interaction with someone or some object uh, who, who ha that has COVID on it. And it's just a risk that's not worth taking. And I understand that many people have heard and and may believe that it's not that serious of a disease or it's only hurting certain people um, that are older. That's not what I'm seeing as a physician. I'm seeing that, of course, there are a lot of people who are older and sicker who are getting it and dying. There's also a scary amount of younger people who are as well. And beyond that, I really uh, fear for my friends and colleagues who work in the hospital settings what I'm seeing happening to them, it happened in Italy and Spain and in New York, is that they, because they're overwhelmed with patients, um, people who did not social distance two weeks ago are now getting sick, very sick, 50 to 100 a day coming into the hospital, that they're not able to protect themselves safely. They're running out of the protective gear um, and they're getting exposed. Many of them are getting sick and some of them are dying. And so I care about my friends and colleagues in Dallas that two weeks from now we'll be in that exact same position. And so I just encourage um, my friends, anyone who's listening to this, to, to humble yourself um, before uh, this, this urging. Um, that's not just from me, but it's, it's, it's really from other physicians and other people who care and honestly, from the strongest warnings are coming from the physicians who are currently living through this right now. They're not lying. They're telling you the truth. Humble yourself before it. Listen, stay inside your home for your sake, for your family's sake, and for the sake of the heroic healthcare workers that, who will risk their lives and some will die saving maybe you 
or someone that you love. So I, I wanted to convey the gravity of that and the humanity of that um, to my friends. The, the main way that, that uh, the virus will enter, it'll, it'll enter through what we call a mucous membrane, which is in the eyes and the nose and, and the mouth. So if you can protect those areas, you actually go a long way to preventing the virus. It, it can't jump through the skin. It can't jump through your head. It can't jump from your hands directly into your body. It has to go from your hands into your eyes, nose, or mouth. It's just very difficult to keep from touching yourself. And, and, and it's just uh, as much as we want to control that, I think we, we struggle with it. So what I would advise to someone who's wondering what are the signs that I or my loved one needs to go to the hospital, it, it's, it's worth understanding how COVID, what COVID does, how the infection works. And so for the first few days, it's, it feels like a, a bad cold, maybe even a sore throat. In other words, it feels like it's more up. Um, and then sometimes there's an improvement. But what it's doing is it's finding its way in many cases down into the deeper parts of the lung. And when it gets into that, that space of the lung, it causes a, a pretty severe and extensive pneumonia. And when that happens, the lungs are just not able to bring enough oxygen into the body. So people will feel shortness of breath. They'll, they'll have trouble completing sentences. They'll be incredibly tired and fatigued, sometimes from very basic things, just like sitting up or going to the bathroom. Uh, so if someone was in that kind of situation where that, those would be signs that your lungs just are not working enough. And if the oxygen level drops too low, you'll pass out and ultimately you'll die. So though, that's really the sign. Um, the two primary signs would be um, not able to complete sentences because you, you just you can't finish you don't have enough air and not able to do very basic tasks like walk across the room those would be signs that the person needs to go to the hospital one thing that i think might is really helpful for all families to go through is to think through the scenario of someone in your family getting COVID 19 and how you would handle that I think that's it's, it's important for practical reasons because the recommendation right now is that that person would self-isolate and that they would go into a room that's separate from others in the house and they would use a separate bathroom. And that when that person goes out from the room, they would make sure that the rest of the family is not around. So it's difficult to, to think through. It's actually quite difficult to live that way and, and many um, Americans are having to live that way. And I'm having to give that advice right now to many people via telemedicine of how to do that. And for some people, it's really difficult. Um, people who might not have much help, who might have uh, a child or a family member that has special needs, it's going to be very difficult. So beginning to think through, how will I handle it if I'm sick and I'm someone uh, that other people depend on? Because uh, many young people are getting sick enough that they're most are not dying, but many young people are getting sick enough, middle-aged people, that they're, they're bed-bound. They're bed-bound for five to seven days. Um, and along with that, uh, it's, it's not that uncommon that that person who's self-isolated gets so sick that they do end up having to go to the hospital. So thinking through what would be the signs that that person needs to go to the hospital and how would I get them there in a way that still protects me so those are, those are realistic, practical things to think about. And I also think it helps to, when you go through that exercise, it helps to make this more of a reality because it's entirely possible given the rate of infection that all of us will be experiencing that directly in our own families or if not there within our immediate surrounding family with a, a brother or a mother or a, a father. No, I think it's, it's normal to ask the question, if you're living with someone and you're around them all the time, how can you possibly self-isolate? And I think it's a good question, but I think that in some ways, this is just like statistics. Um, and the more time that people spend close in close contact with one another, the more likely they are to transmit the virus. So the more, the, the, the more that you can uh, reduce that time together, the, the less likely it is to transmit. It's just purely a matter of statistics. And it's possible that with just a very short amount of time that the virus can spread from one to another. 
but typically it requires a good amount of time. So pulling people apart really does work. It really does help uh, uh, prevent that, that jump uh, from one to another. It's, it's really just as almost as cold as it seems, it's just pure statistics. And there are, there are scenarios where um, uh, you have to attend to the person who might be um, very sick and because maybe they can't go to the hospital or the hospital is more dangerous than staying in the home. Or they won't you take them. Right. They, yeah. And they won't accept them. And so you have, you're faced with a choice of, am I going to just let this person die alone or suffer alone and me not even try to help them because I don't have you here or am I going to do it? And I think that most people will go ahead and, and take the risk. I wish it wasn't, we just didn't have to be that way. I wish our doctors and nurses in the hospital didn't have to make those choices, but they do. And, and they continually choose to, to help. So I, I get it. I think that short of that sort of nightmare scenario, there are, and this is part of the preparation, if you don't have gloves and a mask or any kind of a gown, which most of us don't laying around the house, what kind of preparation can you put in place now? And and there are some things that you could still do. You can you can make sure that there's a certain pair of clothes that you wear uh, that you only wear when you interact with that with that person. And that if you don't have um, medical goggles, but you have some kind of work goggles, it's still worth something. Um, any kind of a mask that prevents uh, the inflow of particles in, into the mouth probably has some kind of benefit as long as it's taken off and, and washed. So I think working through those kinds of things is, 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 is worth doing because it's definitely worth trying to protect yourself if you can. When, when you're faced with a situation that there's someone that you love or that you have a duty to care for in the case of uh, healthcare workers and you just don't have the equipment you need, and that's going to happen. That's going to happen to many people. It's happening right now inside of our hospitals. What do you do? And I think that those are these moments of sort of human heroism and and um, compassion and empathy that that kind of defy, you know, what's the scientific guidance? I understand you love people and you care for people and you recognize you may suffer and die in the course of doing that. And that's happening all over the world right now. People are making choices that they know are putting themselves at risk and, and they may suffer for them, but they do it anyway. And, and I get that. And, and, and I think that faced with those situations, there's uh, really nothing else that you can do.